So yeah, these guys were talking about uh, data science, AI. So I feel like I'm not sure why I'm here, because I'm not going to talk about any of these. <laughs> First of all, second, uh, this is a keynote. So I'm a bit surprised. Usually I'm doing technical talks, which I like of doing those. But I'm not really familiar doing keynote talks. But here I am. Uh, <laughs> second is I'm, I feel pretty bad. Uh, sorry for my voice. I have a bad cold, so all odds are against us to have a very bad uh, keynote. So let's start. <laughs> so leaving the paradigm shift. So just a couple of sentences about who I am uh, and why you should give any credibility for things I'm going to say. Uh, don't get everything uh, granted, so basically you should just extrapolate some information out of this at the end of the talk. but. Yeah, this is my paradigm shift, which I'm leaving the second or third time. Uh, and I'm pretty confident that in a very short time, you are going to leave the same. So uh, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders and CTO of Banzai Cloud. Uh, with the same folks, uh, we had a startup called Sequence IQ, started in 2014, and we, that was acquired by Hortonworks. So I guess we know a bit about uh, big data. My interest is mostly about scheduling distributed systems. Again, I don't, I'm not sure why I'm here. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in big data. <laughs> so, but okay, so let's start, hopefully. <laughs> this is going to be a good talk at the end of the day. So a bit of history of disruption, so just to understand from where I'm coming from. So initially in, uh, in the 60s, basically, the virtual machine concept has been born. Uh, then this was prototyped by VMware uh, in the 90s, and they got commercialized in 98. Uh, so basically, the whole VM, virtual VM stuff started back then. Uh, and after the success of VMware, a couple of open source projects started. Xen was pretty uh, popular and started in 2003. Then we had KVM, uh, which, was, which is in the kernel from 2.6.20 started in 2007. Uh, so actually, first time when I saw Xen uh, in 2003, we've been doing with one of my colleagues uh, some application servers. And this really blew us our mind, like how we can, how we can build and how easy we can build uh, clusters on one single laptop, for instance. And then based on the popularity of VMs, the public clouds came in. So obviously, everybody knows about Amazon. They started in 2000. Uh, Four actually internally, and then they, they launched the service in 2006. Uh, and it was pretty popular, and, and basically they have created a market of, uh, yeah, this is a pretty big number. It's a $411 billion market, the cloud market. And then, uh, obviously, innovation never stops. So uh, the third paradigm shift started. So we started, containers uh, were started. Uh, Google started Elixir back in 2008, actually. Uh, so it's been, with, it's been in the Linux kernel for quite a while. And then Docker started in 2013. Uh, and then I guess we all know the history since then, uh, how containers, how popular are containers. Uh, and then obviously containers are not really helping you with too many things, so we need orchestration. And in 2014, like mid-2014, mid 2014 project called Kubernetes started by Google again. Okay. So just to understand where I'm coming from, so I had this moment like, OK, something's wrong here. I was working, uh, I was in my hotel room in London uh, coming up from a customer. And I was installing Hadoop clusters um, and application servers. And I, was, I had a feeling like, OK, something is wrong here. Like, why it takes six months to build a Hadoop cluster? I was checking all the documentation available back then, all the vendors like having 60 40 pages PDF is with big red arrows, like you do this, do that. Nothing was automated. Uh, said, OK, so we need to do something about this. And then this was 2012. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, yeah, we were start, we've been thinking in 2013 how we can do this, how we can do that. We started to build our own components of service discovery, registry, orchestration. Back then, there was no Kubernetes, it was only Docker. Uh, so we basically, we built all the components which today are out of the box available in Kubernetes, which we all throw away. But it was a good experience because we learned a lot about distributed systems uh, and big data in particular, and how we should actually 
consume these technologies the right way. So we found, we found the sequence cycle in 2014. Uh, basically, it was a Hadoop self service Hadoop everywhere, running on public clouds. Actually, it was running on containers, uh, so you could uh, you could use it everywhere. And then we introduced something which was pretty uh, interesting back then, like SLA policy based auto scaling. So we've been able to scale the clusters. Uh, but this was this was against totally against what vendors were charging back then. So the vendors, all big data vendors were doing like, okay, they've been thinking in nodes, nodes, nodes. So you need to, we are selling support for nodes. Everything is about nodes. But actually, on my perspective, it was like, we should think about workloads, we should think about clusters. Like, I mean, no one cares about nodes, right? Nodes are just basically just there to execute your, your program. So we built this platform. Uh, we pushed down the Hadoop stack provisioning in any cloud providers to eight minutes. Uh, and then we were very happy, and then Kubernetes came in. And as I said, we had to throw, away, throw everything <laughs> away. So this was, from my perspective, this was one of the biggest paradigm shifts in the last 20 years. Like, everything now is getting containerized. Uh, every, basically, cloud is a commodity now. Uh, containers are going to be, or Kubernetes is going to be a commodity now. So I think people should not think on infrastructure anymore. Infrastructure is just there to execute your your applications. So yeah, in 2015, I guess, so we pub one of my colleagues, he just put out, put down this uh, Twitter message that we've been provisioning Cardi Node cluster uh, in eight minutes, which was very unique back then. Uh, apparently, yeah, the, the theory of relativity might go wrong. So last time I checked, we had to remove containers after the, the the acquisition, and now it's, we are back to 26 minutes. Uh, so I guess <laughs> I don't know how these things are working, but the law of thermodynamics, I think the second law says that time has a certain arrow. But in this particular case, now the technology and what we get currently, what we have currently from vendors against went backwards. So it's 26 minutes. So what's paradigm shift? So I took this from the Merriam-Webster. Uh, library. I'm not going to read it out, but basically it's, it's a totally different change in approaching uh, some problem. So yeah, I did mention uh, that my belief is that Kubernetes is going to change everything, and it's going to change how we consume big data, and how we're actually going to run big data frameworks. So what's Kubernetes? So besides CIOs or CXOs, or CEOs, uh, buzzword recently in, in earning calls, like how are we going to save Lots of money based on, like, we are moving our applications to to Kubernetes. Uh, actually, there is a totally different story for that. So first, Kubernetes is a container orchestration uh, system for scale. I can't really say that it's a product itself. It's more like a framework. So you need to actually do quite a lot of things in order to get your applications running on Kubernetes. But this is a framework which we have never had before. Uh, a framework which gives you a common runtime to run your applications everywhere. When I, and, and when I mean everywhere, I really think, I really believe everywhere. It's like the same way how you are writing your productizing your application and pushing to Kubernetes, the same way you are going to run in the cloud provider or on-prem, or actually hybrid environments through federated clusters. And the reason why, why it's happening this way is like the guys from Kubernetes, basically they, they rethink, they took the experience of Google building architectures for 20 years or so, and basically they rating the whole system in a way that everything has a built-in service discovery and auto-scaling, so these are native native cons uh, components of the platform, uh, and they invented the plugin systems. And what I mean under plugin systems is like, usually when you are running any application, but especially big data applications, you need storage, obviously, because you have lots of data. You need network, uh, of course. You need security, compute, memory, all these things. So what these guys did is like, okay, these are only like resources uh, for Kubernetes, and those resources are not on demand. Basically, those resources are claim based. And what I mean, and they got the, all the vendors. For example, they got the cloud vendors to implement their own plugin when you are claiming a resource. So what I mean under claiming a resource. So for example. You have Kubernetes master, you can't avoid that, obviously. So you have a master control plane somewhere running, uh, doesn't really matter where. 
it's up to you. Uh, so you got a control plane and say, okay, now you launch an application, a big data application, uh, of one of the cloud providers, and then that application basically it needs to either to scale or needs some resources like okay, it needs additional memory or needs additional CPU, uh, so on, so on. So what you can do about this, like currently today, what you can go to basically the whole world is like it's flat. So you go to the cloud provider, you say, okay, I want to add six more nodes. You add these six more nodes, you specify the node type, you specify all your requirements beforehand. Actually, you specify all these things before you know actually you, you believe that you are going to need this. And then you create the infrastructure, and then on the top of the infrastructure, you publish your Spark or, or whatever workload you are running, and that, if that application is get deployed there, and now executors are picking up the new CPUs, and your everything is fine, your application is moving ahead fast. However, on Kubernetes, everything is a different way. So basically, you have claims, like, okay, your application now has resource claims, and what, what I mean on the lead is like, the Kubernetes, the application is going to submit this claim, okay, I need, I believe I need 20 virtual CPUs. We are not talking about nodes, we are not talking about infrastructure or anything like that. I need network, for example, I need X number of virtual CPUs, I need X number of, of, no, uh, of memory. Oops. Okay. And then the cloud provider where you are running, uh, for example, if you're running on AWS, AWS did write all the plugins for, for Kubernetes, and then the cloud provider is basically going to push the infrastructure on the need of you. So you as an application developer, as a big data developer, you don't have to care about infrastructure anymore. Uh, not from coding perspective, not from DevOps perspective. So you get everything based on claims. And how this working uh, based on claims and these plugins. And basically, each and every cloud provider, AWS, Azure, you name it, Oracle, Alibaba Cloud, uh, Google Cloud, they all implemented these plugins. Uh, and obviously, there are lots of plugins for, for, uh, on -prem by, for made by on-prem vendors. Sorry. So how this works, like in Kubernetes, basically there is a state and there is a reconciliation loop. So there is the, the, the actual truth is the, actu the, the, the truth of the system is basically is a current state, and then your application has a desired state. And for all resources, as I said, memory, whatever, uh, CPU, network, so on, so on. Basically, you have you have a claim, and then that you you publish your application, submit those claims, and then there is a reconciliation loop for each and every claim, and then basically by the plugins by itself are going to take care uh, to move the system from the this, the current state into the expected state. Uh, so this is how it works behind the scene, and it's actually it's working inside your cluster. So the nothing nothing is happening outside, so you don't have to go to talk with AWS APIs. We don't have to do externally anything. It's happening inside the system. Uh, and it's happening in a way that there are no shortcuts. So basically, you cannot do like, OK, my application developer found this, and then we have a shortcut, or we have a backdoor, how we do this and that. Actually, you cannot do that. It's all airbag based and, and basically, uh, there is a contract for everything you want to do. And it's, a, it, and it's a standardized contract. And this is, this is why it's working on-prem. This is why it's working on cloud providers. Uh, because basically there is a there is a standard contract, and this pattern is recurring everywhere in the system, uh, and this is how it works behind the scene. A bit more details, but I don't. Hi and this is the same paradigm, like the, the same reconciliation, actually, or the same claim-based stuff. It's implemented inside the system as well. So I don't want to enter into too deep technical details because this is a, a keynote. But at the end of the day, Kubernetes have something. Uh, where the state of truth is stored, it's stored. It's called etcd. So it's basically a key value store based on a raft, implement, raft implementation, which basically it's always uh, it's a it's a linearized uh, representation of the system. And it stores the truth. So if you want to do anything with the system, actually the cube API, the the, uh, the through the API server, where is your first uh, line of uh, interaction with with Kubernetes is, and basically you push this into etcd. And then you have different parts of the system, like the scheduler, for example, which picks from SCD uh, and make the decision like, OK, now I got this request, or I got this claim that I need to schedule X number of pods. Those pods are, can be, for example, Spark executors. And then it, it beam packs the pods if it has to, or, the, or it, it checks whether are the, the, what are the replication factors, what are the, the beam packing rules, uh, what are the affinity, anti-affinity rules, and then makes a decision. Uh, 
and then the, that decision gets back into the SCD, and then basically the cubelet which is starting, which is uh, uh, spinning up actually the actual containers, reads from there, uh, it gets the decision as granted, then basically moves the system into the state uh, it should be. And then the loop is done. So it's all, uh, so even internally, this, this whole uh, loop is uh, programmed. So why I'm saying all these things? So I, I, again, like last year, uh, when we left uh, Hortonverse, we had this feeling that uh, actually I went to KubeCon on April, and then I came back uh, on Friday from KubeCon, uh, and I called my boss and I said I'm going to, to quit on Monday. So it was, for me, it was such a big paradigm shift uh, that, uh, yeah, that from my point of view, it was something like, okay, so we need to do this this way, otherwise, uh, I think, I, I mean, I, I feel this is the best way to do. But obviously, there are uh, the vendors or the, the big data community is doing their own stuff as well. Uh, but I had this feeling like something is wrong again, so I, like I had this feeling in 2012. So I, I keep on recurring having these feelings that something is always wrong, so it's maybe, the problem is maybe with me. So. Hadoop 3 obviously has been released last year uh, with a bunch of announcements, but actually Hadoop 3.1 and 3.2 is going to uh, contain a couple of interesting uh, items uh, like GPU support, uh, storage, so all these things. The vendor services, so we got Yarn, obviously. So this is, uh, sorry if, I, if it's not really clear, on the left-hand side, it's basically it's Yarn, which is the, the, the scheduler of, uh, of big data applications, or most of the, the big data applications out there. Uh, and a few of the vendors are trying to push Yarn like to compete with Kubernetes, which I think it's, uh, it's totally makes no sense because even the community and the pace and everything is much more faster. So this is a war which you, you are not going to win. Uh, but big data applications at the same time, they still need, for example, GPUs because yeah, everybody now is doing and talking about AI, machine learning, so you cannot do anything about GPUs. So this has been pushed in, in Hadoop 3.1, I guess. It's already inside. Uh, in Kubernetes, this has been available since uh, 1.6. So actually, they took again a totally different uh, different approach. So why, for example, this is so slow, adding everything which is on the left hand side into ER? It's because it's like basically it's hard coded into the system as well. Whereas in Kubernetes, they took the totally different approach. They took the plugin mechanism. And they said like, okay, if you want to schedule by GPU, here's the plugin for scheduling based on a certain resource types. And they say, like, OK, you now you can write a plugin. So NVIDIA came in and said, oh, obviously, I want to sell my NVIDIA uh, GPUs. So I did, they quickly did write a plugin for, for NVIDIA. Other vendors, they quickly write their own plugin. Uh, there are a bunch of FPGA plugins. Uh, there are a couple of uh, network adapter plugins, a couple InfiniBand device plugins. So basically, now you can schedule pretty much by you name it in Kubernetes, whereas currently, uh, in Yarn, you can schedule by memory, CPU, and, and, and GPU, as far as I can tell. Services, so obviously, when you have an application running, then obviously you need to expose services. Uh, I think it's no comment here. Search for, for topology in, in Hadoop, and you will find like 10 open pull requests since 2004. Storage, now in Hadoop 3.x, 1 or 0, uh, erasure coding came in, uh, Ozone, which is an S3 implementation, came in. Again, Kubernetes did a totally different way. Like, OK, they, they did a container storage interface. Everybody who's got a storage implementation can write their own plugin. And obviously, there are like 20 times more plugins available currently. Every object store, uh, blob storages, uh, you name it, Ceph, uh, Gluster FS, it's all available. Network, obviously, uh, it sounds weird. You don't want to schedule, or why would you want to, why would you like to schedule by network? So actually, uh, while I was working uh, on big data space, we actually we had certain occasions where we ran out of of uh, the cloud providers. AW, in this case, it's AWS uh, network throughput. So we had to scale up on different availability zones, and we've been running out. We've been basically adding compute instances just because we had network need. So this is totally again a different approach with Kubernetes. And then we got applications. Now Yarn up, I guess uh, Yarn is doing application uh, kind of things. Uh, I guess I haven't seen any application yet, but there will be something, I think. Uh, Kubernetes, again, is doing this a totally application agnostic. So we are talking now about Spark, but at the same time, we could talk about Tomcat, MySQL, uh, whatever. 
So basically, there is a plugin, there is, a, there is an interface or, and an implementation for that called Helm, where it's a contract. This, this is how an application should look like if you want to seamlessly publish to Kubernetes and you want to get all the features like security, uh, resiliency, AJ, so on, so on. So since we are at a big data university uh, conference, a bit about like, okay, so what's the state of big data currently in Kubernetes? So we got Spark on Kubernetes. This is in the best shape uh, out of, of all the others. And the reason for this is because big companies uh, like Google, uh, Red Hat, I'm not uh, saying we are big company, but like us, uh, we are pushing this. Uh, so we did a couple of uh, pull requests in. So did the community did a bunch of pull requests like these companies. And currently now, since uh, Spark 2.3, this is uh, now basically Spark. It's almost, I would say, it's almost a, a, a first class citizen in Kubernetes. There are a couple of things which are missing, like the resource staging server is not, not there yet, the driver pod uh, is not uh, resilient, uh, but those will come in 2.4. Like we have a branch which we have fixed those, but uh, the good thing is that this is coming. So now you can submit your Spark application to Kubernetes and get actually you don't have any other scheduler, Kubernetes is going to schedule uh, your Spark jobs. So this is how it looks like. You have a Spark submit, you have a resource staging server. These are all, indi these are all actually individual containers. They scale, or you, the system scales them only what you need. So if you need more executors, we'll give more executors, if uh, shuffle, and so on, and so on. So these are the, these are the five uh, containers, how it's split in. The monolith is split into basically uh, different containers for Spark. Obviously, there is CI CD support where you can spin up now a cluster. So we are back again. The time goes the right way. So we, you can spin up a cluster in two, three minutes. And actually, from Spark Submit, you have a Spark application executors running on Kubernetes. Uh, I mean, this is not a time race, but for a CI CD system, system uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. And you got default observability. So what I mean on it is like in Kubernetes, obviously, since it's a highly distributed system, you want to uh, you want to see, or you want to ha you want to, hi to have a high visibility what's happening inside the system. So you got out of the box lock collection, for example. You got monitoring. Uh, these are all built on on CNCF uh, standard uh, implementations. So Zeppelin again, it's pretty popular. Uh, so you can run now with Spark. Uh, you can run a, a Spark interpreter on Kubernetes through Zeppelin. Uh, actually, this pull request it was done by me, but I don't believe that it's ever going to uh, get upstream uh, because there is a huge uh, resistance from, from vendors. They don't want to get this working. Uh, but the good thing is that it's available in open source and there are a bunch of people using this. So you can, you can, have, you can have basically a, a Zeppelin notebook in, in your uh, Git or GitHub or whatever system and then from there uh, you can push from code to cluster and again in like three minutes you have a running notebook. So this is good for those who are doing data science. Data scientists, they don't know anything about infrastructure. They know about obviously a lot about SQL and notebooks. So they basically, they just operate on the notebook. And behind the scene, Kubernetes will give them the infrastructure without them doing actually anything. They don't even have to understand what's going on behind the scene. Kafka on Kubernetes. So the biggest pain point of Kubernetes, of Kafka on Kubernetes was, was Zookeeper. So basically, no one wanted to maintain a Zookeeper cluster in Kubernetes just because there is already one called etcd, which is part of Kubernetes. And actually, uh, I believe it's way better. Uh, so it's just like one word. Uh, if you take it's only, for example, let's say it takes speed. But there is actually there is another word which I can't pronounce. But yeah. Uh, and you can scale a Kafka cluster based on, on metrics, QDepth. Uh, so now you have options like LinkedIn and all these guys, Confluent, are writing all kind of different systems to basically scale your Kafka brokers, which is totally nonsense. If you have this in Kubernetes, basically you don't have to do any of this. You get all the features out of the box for Kubernetes from Kubernetes. Uh, so you don't have to worry about like, okay, now I need to scale vertically, I need to scale horizontally, actually I, might, my, I need to add different uh, nodes into the system. <coughs> and this is the, this is the biggest thing. Uh, from my point of view, which is which is going to be a game changer. Uh, so currently, I said there are this uh, 411,000 uh, billion uh, cloud market, 
which is huge, but actually, uh, based on the last research, last year there was a 10 billion waste in the cloud uh, overspending. So what I understand under overspend overspending is like nobody is using the right resource types because people they just don't know. We know from our experience, from our previous startup, like people are always asking, okay, what kind of instances should I launch? Usually everybody was launching M3x large or M4x large because yeah, this is a generic purpose. Uh, VM, it works, it's very nice, and then basically it turns out that they use either 20% of the CPU or 40-50% of the memory, so on, so on. Uh, so we should think, of, we should forget everything about thinking in nodes and thinking about like, okay, so this is how a node looks like. We should think in resources. Uh, so that's my view on 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 this. So we should think about my application has dynamic CPU or my application has dynamic memory needs or network needs or whatever or storage needs. And we should have a system which actually recommends us the infrastructure. So this is something which we have built at uh, Banzai Cloud uh, where basically on currently we are available on two different cloud providers. You came to us, you have a workload, and then basically that's it. You can specify your stuff like I want virtual X number of virtual CPUs, I want uh, this amount of memory. You can specify boundaries, uh, and then basically you can specify some scaling rules, and we turn these specifications, or if you don't specify anything, we turn the workload actually into infrastructures. So you don't have to think in infrastructure anymore. You think in like resources, which actually you are paying for. That's the only thing you are paying for. You are paying for the use resources. And my view in this is that you should not pay more at all. And we are leveraging Kubernetes node pools. Again, this is a, this is a, a concept which uh, where it allows you to have heterogi uh, heterogeneous clusters. Uh, so this is a new pattern of software delivery. Uh, this is a new paradigm shift, how I view these things. So everything is containerized. So I mean, I think these days, nobody is uh, talking about containers uh, just for the hype. Now people are actually containerizing for the real benefits. Uh, lots of com containers uh, are composing an application. And applications are actually are, are resembled by CI/CD workflows, where you have build testing, uh, so on, assembled into an application or either binaries or a contract, and then based on this, uh, what's coming out from your CI/CD system, then basically you, you have a, you create an infrastructure. But this should be everything automated, and you don't have to think about like, okay, so how the infrastructure should look like? It's dynamically adapting to your needs. Uh, so infrastructures are basically are getting, uh, as cloud is commodity now, the old infrastructure is getting, uh, basically it's purely a resource pool and is getting uh, commoditized. Uh, and this is what Kubernetes can help you, can put all these things together. Uh, obviously this is just a framework, as I said, so it's right. It's, a, it's another tooling which uh, most, of peop most of the people, they don't have the experience or they are afraid from, of, but this is the direction the world is going, so this is something which we never had before unique contract which allows you to run your application or big data workloads everywhere. So what's the magic formula? Obviously there is no magic formula. It's, uh, it's US somebody, everybody is gonna taste 42. <laughs> so it's basically the only thing from this formula is like you have the value and you have the risk which we cannot, you don't know. Every, each and every enterprise has its own value and its own risk of, of migration. You cannot quantify it. The only thing which you can quantify sort of is the time which you can't really quantify, but based on my, my, my limited knowledge of maths, if you divide with a, le with a smaller number, then basically the result is going to be bigger. So this is where we can help you, and this is where Kubernetes can help you. It's like the T is going to be as low as possible, as low as possible. Otherwise, just say 42. So how to adapt uh, to this uh, quickly changing world? So obviously, first, uh, the vendors are looking uh, the whole community, which my personal view is that uh, fighting against all these changes are useless because uh, others are going to implement this. If you don't implement this, others are going to do that instead of uh, you, and then you lose all the all your your leverage. Uh, so it makes no sense to fight against this. My personal view again, uh, you should see the opportunity on this change. Uh, because all, none of the big data vendors are basically infrastructure companies. You know very well what, how Spark works, you know like, uh, you, you know big data patterns, you know machine learning, but you don't know infrastructure, believe me, you don't know. So you should focus on compute query and streaming only, and then let others write the infrastructure, or actually 
you should not think on infrastructure anymore. Obviously, you as a customer, most of you being here, you should demand change. You should say, okay, I, I want to give it a try to this and that, uh, and then turn your, in your internal infrastructure to a software-defined infrastructure to save you lots of money. Uh, and then as a developer, if you are interested in all kind of things, then obviously this is everything happening in the open source, so you should be open to new technologies, try to contribute, innovate, uh, and then I think that's my... I skip this. Uh, it's more like an advertisement, so... I think that's... that's uh, I'm not sure if I run out of time, most likely, yes. Uh, that was my talk about the paradigm shift. So we are definitely at Bonsai Cloud, we are leaving this paradigm shift. A uh, few of you, potentially, you are, are already leaving this, but in, in a very short time, all of us are going to live in this paradigm shift. So I think there is time to adapt. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if there is time for questions. Yeah? Okay, if there are no questions, then thank you. Thank you.